It's an unprecedented series of workplace accidents in the state. Since mid-March, the number of Hanford workers seeking medical help after breathing in chemical vapors has risen to 34. Just last week, six more people were exposed to poisonous gases at the site. In her continuing investigation, the human toll of Hanford's dirty secrets, King 5 Susanna Frame joins us to expose how outdated laws and ignored calls for change keep these workers at risk. That's right, Lori. You would think if you issue a complaint about a safety hazard at your job, the state would most likely come on in and investigate. They might order some changes or even impose fines if things didn't shape up. But that's not the way it rolls at Hanford, where decades-old law means no outside safety scrutiny is allowed. And workers say it's time to ditch that antiquated system. When Washington state workers began producing plutonium in the 40s, less than 1% of the workforce had any idea what they were making. It was that secret at Hanford, code name Site W by the U.S. government. In 1945, this government video revealed the truth. Our nation possessed the ingredients for the most powerful weapons ever conceived, and the secret was out. But the cult of secrecy continued. For national security, Congress gave the Department of Energy the power to oversee itself during the Cold War, including its health and safety program, a policy that, 25 years later, is still around today. We are not waging the Cold War anymore. Bob Alvarez is a former presidential advisor, one of the top nuclear policy experts in the world. He says the recent sick workers are the latest casualties of that culture of mystery. Vapors causing serious illnesses at Hanford isn't new. The incidents go back 30 years. Yet at Hanford, the most contaminated workplace in the nation, OSHA can't get past the gates to investigate, order changes like making respirators mandatory, or issue fines. Safeguards that are routine at every other job site in the state. Isolation, secrecy, privilege, lack of accountability. All these things are hallmarks of the Cold War and are still alive and well in the Department of Energy. It has turned my life upside down. I'm, I am no longer the person I used to be seven years ago. Diana Gag didn't used to need these canes to get around the house or take a load of medications to make it through the day. Well, I take these two, these two are for my dementia. For 20 years, she was a heavy equipment operator at Hanford and loved it until everything changed in 2007. She was working a bulldozer above some of the underground nuclear storage tanks, where scientists have documented more than 1,200 radioactively contaminated chemicals in the nuclear waste. I kept smelling this chlorine ammonia type smell. On that day in 07, some of that waste spilled onto the ground and Gag, without a respirator, inhaled chemical vapors for a few hours before an alarm went off. This was like having the rug jerked out from underneath me. Seriously. She's left with brain damage, sudden tremors, vision loss, and dementia. Illnesses the government admits were caused by that exposure. It gets really bad sometimes. During our interview, her right leg and arm trembled on and off. It's like being in a bad accident and having a brain injury and you can't, you're not there anymore. It's sad. She can no longer go outside without a wheelchair, cook, or drive. I feel like I've fought a cold war and the government's left me behind. The former construction crew leader, archery champ, grandmother full of energy and ideas, today um, fights to remember the basics. At this point in the interview, she was describing her daily medications. Uh, the Celebrex is for uh, my uh, King 5 has uncovered a slew of expert reports saying the Department of Energy needs to get out of the business of policing itself. In 1995, the department's own advisory committee found self-regulation has failed, and a subsequent working group of senior managers recommended safety and health should be externally regulated by a group such as OSHA. In 1992, the former head of OSHA wrote, Hanford's failure to solve chemical vapor problems would be viewed by OSHA as willful violations of law and subject to possible criminal penalties. 
25 years worth of advice and the same old no consequence, no penalty process is still in place. And I'm going, really? What? They said they were going to take care of it back then, you know, that we can figure out how to deal with these problems, and they're not. It's not any different than it ever was. With the Department of Energy calling its own safety shots, critics say they've got a pass to ignore repeat recommendations, like installing what are called scrubbers, technology meant to capture the chemical gases before they vent into the open air. We've got to have some change here. And that, what that means is there needs to be an enforcement regime that makes them do things. Hanford expert Tom Carpenter helped author a 2010 study urging the Department of Energy to invest in the equipment. It's simple technology. It's not rocket science. Again, a lot of uh, chemical sites use these things, uh, but not at Hanford. They're just deemed too expensive, and, and uh, they just said no out of hand. They're not, they're not going to do it. As for the U.S. Department of Energy, they say they're considering that technology and more, and that they aren't pursuing OSHA oversight because their regulations are better, more protective of worker health and safety than OSHA's. They also tell King their safety performance is better than comparable industry performance. People are still being affected. Obviously, they're not doing enough to prevent it. For sick workers like Diana Gegg, those government assurances don't mean much. She's 100% disabled and won't ever work again. I am, I am angry about it. I talked with uh, Representative Adam Smith in Washington, D.C. about this very topic two weeks ago. He's a ranking Democrat on the Armed Services Committee. He said everyone knows what's going on at Hanford now. There's no national security issues left. And if OSHA can provide better oversight, we ought to consider it. And when I asked him if he would personally ever work to amend that current federal law to make that happen, he said certainly. So we'll be tracking uh, developments. In DC. Well, now over the years, the Department of Energy has said, okay, we're going to monitor ourselves, basically. In all those years, did they ever find somebody, punish a manager that was um, not doing his or her job? They, did they, they do anything? Yeah, they do have that authority. They can investigate, they right. can um, mandate things, they can issue fines. But we found that uh, the Department of Energy has done that only a handful of times. And at Hanford, they've never used those powers concerning chemical vapor exposures. So 30 years of chemical vapor exposures and nothing, no fines, nothing about it. All right. Suzanne, so thanks. technological sure. prowess, you would think that the world would have figured out by now a way to safely store nuclear waste. But a disturbing story emerging out of New Mexico's Los Alamos laboratory demonstrates that once again, humanity is clueless when it comes to managing radioactive material. Last week, the U.S. Energy Department announced that it would miss a deadline to move drums of nuclear waste from the laboratory to a more secure facility in Texas. See, with wildfire season fast approaching, officials are worried that the fires could reach Los Alamos, requiring the removal of nearly 4,000 cubic meters of waste by the end of June. But thanks to a radiological leak from one of the containers back in February, officials can't be certain about the safety of transferring these hazardous materials. And the likely cause of the leak? kitty litter. Yes, it's comforting to know that the same material I use to dispose cat crap is also used to secure nuclear waste. <laughs> Officials are saying that the switch to organic kitty litter caused a heat reaction and the subsequent release of radiation. Now, the leak occurred at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIPP, in nearby Carlsbad, New Mexico, where these drums are usually transferred, given that this plant is the country's only long-term nuclear waste storage facility of its kind. But since that leak, the Department of Energy has shut down the WIPP until it can determine that the facility is safe. But when it comes to the nuclear industry, it's not just radioactive waste that we have to worry about. It's astronomical monetary waste as well. Over in Charlestown, South Carolina, the federal government is injecting billions of dollars into a nuclear project that it doesn't even want. See, all the way back in 1999, the government signed off on a deal to construct a plant that would transform plutonium into commercial fuel. Nuclear fuel, rather. Sounds like a great way to convert waste into something usable, right? Well, unfortunately, not one nuclear power plant in the country has actually agreed to burn the fuel in its reactors. 
And fast forward nearly 15 years later, and the original $1.7 billion price tag project has ballooned to $3.5 billion and is expected to cost at least another $4 billion to complete. Furthermore, officials now claim that altogether, the project will cost more than $30 billion to operate the plant for the next 20 years. Well, all of these factors have led the Energy Department to call for the halt of the useless plant's construction. And Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz, who is one of the architects who helped broker the initial deal, is on board as well. Great. But thanks to South Carolina politicians who love seeing the infusion of federal cash into the state, that's not happening anytime soon. In fact, back in April, South Carolina Republican Governor Nikki Haley actually threatened to sue if the government halted construction. Haley said that the plant's costs are not the state's problems and told reporters, quote, you've made a very real investment. There's a structure and everything there, and now they're just going to walk away from it? It really defies all logic. Actually, Nikki, what really defies all logic is that this plan was ever approved in the first place. Because thanks to last month's audit from the Energy Department's Inspector General, we now know that long before the project was approved, officials discovered the building's designs were so shoddy that they didn't even meet the department's minimal standards for approval. Sounds par for the course. But thanks to the bureaucratic nightmare that is the Energy Department, the project was approved. And now we're set to spend another $442 million on the steaming pile of worthlessness during this year alone. So once again, nuclear is creating all kinds of nightmares everywhere you look. But I guess that's just the price we pay for technological insanity. Local officials handed out potassium iodide at the Webster Wegmans this morning to folks who live near Ganae Nuclear Power Plant. The Ganae Nuclear Power Plant, I should say. The pills are handed out every seven years as a precautionary measure. They're free to anyone who, live, uh, who lives within 10 miles of that power plant. Government officials will instruct residents to take the tablets in a state of emergency to protect themselves from nuclear iodide.